Hi guys, hello, welcome to MTB discussion. So let's quickly get into it. Uh, I'll just uh, simplify the question and I'll discuss with you with the suggested answer. In suggested answer, I'll mark the important keywords which you should mention your and which should be there in your answer. And let's see here, see like this the ones which I have rounded here are the important questions which you should see before your exams which will which I can tell you which is important from the exam point of view which can come in your, in your exam this time it's possible it can it can come and also I am uh, I have written here companies act and where it is from LLP and partnership act this question is also very very important and uh, next is this partnership act this question at least see these questions and go before your exams this can come in your exams you can see this directly uh, in your exams uh, it's possible it, it it happens usually so don't forget to see these questions before you go to your exams i'll quickly discuss the mtp now and one more thing those of you guys who are seeing this video please comment down below if these videos are helping you or not because i want to know your uh, opinion suggestions if anything uh, which i should change in my teaching method because uh, i don't know who is seeing these videos so please uh, comment down below which will help me to improve my teaching now coming to question number one in this question what happens is there is a businessman uh, who has uh, like two sons and one married daughter so he wanted to gift his house to his daughter so he called his lawyer and uh, got the written document for such gift and he transferred the document pro the transfer document uh, property to be registered the lawyer told him that you should get the pro uh, to be registered to get it registered so they were going to get the property registered uh, but they met with an accident and uh, both of them died later on the daughter found out the document document uh, found the document and she claimed the house on that basis so the question is whether she can get the house as a gift uh, under the indian contract act 1872 this question is based on section 25 the as you know section 25 the transfer without the consideration in that what is the first case what was the first case the first case was uh, transfer uh, to a person um, who out of the love and affection which is a uh, transfer without the consideration it is valid this much everyone will be knowing you will also be know this much point in that because after seeing this question you will be able to write this but the important part of the answer is this is the important part i'll mark it here these things which you should write in your exam this is very important this if these points are there in your answer the evaluator will give you full marks i can guarantee you that see what should be there now coming so to this section 25 of the indian contract act it provides that an agreement made without the consideration is valid if it is expressed in writing and registered uh, for the law of time being enforced and uh, get the registration of the documents made uh, account of love, natural love and affection between the parties standing in near relation to each other. So, uh, this point you will be able to write on account of natural love and affection, you will be able to, you will be knowing it, you will write it. But the important part of the answer is this is the important part which the students can skip sometimes. It should be in writing and should be registered. This is the important part, should be registered. In this case, what happened? The document was not yet registered. They were going to get the document registered, but what happened is on the road, they met with an accident and they died off. So it is not enforceable as per law because since it is not registered, it is in writing, but it is not registered. So now the answer will be uh, in the conclusion is given here. The transfer is not enforceable. You can just write the same thing out of natural love. He was giving the transferring the property of the natural love and affection between the parties standing in relation with each other. It is written but it is not registered. You can just mention that. That is the conclusion. This question see only this much answer is there. You can score how much? 4 marks. 4 marks it matters 4 marks matters for the person who has scored 36 marks and 4 marks matter for the person who has scored 56 marks because 56 mark can score it to exemption and the 36 marks can score 40 we can pass in law i'm telling you it's very important to do these questions before you go to your exams and this first question is okay it's not that much important since I'll, that you guys have studied the indian contract act properly and you know everything you can write this answer on your own but the important part which the students will skip that much i'll tell you in this question as i said this one uh, section 25 you can mention if you know the section but don't go to wrong section you can just write as per the indian contract act 1872 this much you should remember indian contract act 1872 1872 also you should remember then 
you can just write the agreement made without the consideration is valid if it is in writing and registered these two words if it is there and section 25 it is there and out of natural love and affection between the party standing in your relationship with each other if it is there and the conclusion this transfer is not enforceable if you write even this much now i can guarantee you that the person who is correcting the paper he will give you at least out of four three marks definitely he will give you i can guarantee you that i know the valuation system so i am telling you this so in this uh, this is the conclusion part this is the uh, provision part you have to write uh, as i told you i marked the key points in this you have to write the green green highlighted part you should definitely write in you should be there in your answer otherwise they won't give you marks next coming to question number 2 So coming to question number two. In question number two, what happens is uh, there is a, as per the articles of association, the board of directors can take loan up to fifty lakhs by passing the BR. But they were in case they want the amount in excess of the set limit, they have to pass the SR special resolution. SR means special resolution, BR means board resolution. I hope you know that. So what happened is they needed the funds urgently. So they applied for the loan in the bank. The board of directors for 60 lakhs without passing the SR. This is the important line in the question. Uh, this is the important line 60 lakhs without passing the SR. This is the important line without passing the SR. They applied for the loan. And the bank, uh, what the bank did, the board of directors uh, gave the undertaking. They gave the undertaking to the bank that the SR has been passed by the uh, pass first loan. And the bank, believing such undertaking, lent the money. But on the demanding the repayment of the loan, the company said they denied the payment on the act that it was ultra waste to the company. We did not pass the SR only. How did he give us the loan? That was the question. Now, this is based on doctrine of indoor management. I hope you know that it is the opposite of doctrine of constructive notice. As per the doctrine of indoor management, what happens? The outsiders are protected in this. The outsiders are protected, but there are two exceptions to that indoor management as well. I won't discuss the exceptions because I will only stick to the question. What does the question in this question? What happens is the outsider is protected, that is the bank. Bank can claim the repayment of the uh, loan. How? Why? Because the in, as per the doctrine of indoor management, the person who are dealing with the company they are assumed to have read the documents of the company, but they need not inquire further into the uh, matters of the internal affairs. Whether they have passed the SR or not, it is not the bank's duty to check to inquire into the matter. If they have given the undertaking that they have passed it, the bank can trust it and they can give the loan. So that's what you should write in your answer. I'll mark the keywords uh, in the answer, you know, suggested answer, which you should write in your exam. If it is there, they will they'll give you marks. Now coming to answer. What you should write in your answer. First, I'll discuss the answer. As per the doctrine of indoor management, persons who are dealing with the company are presumed to have read the register documents and see that the proposed dealing is not inconsistent with the therewith. But they are not bound to do more. They need not inquire into the regularity of the internal proceedings of the company by as per the memorandum and articles. As per the memorandums and articles. This was decided in the in case of Royal British Bank versus Starco and yes, I forgot to mention. This is this uh, case study is very very important. You should mention whenever the case, uh, whenever a question on doctrine of indoor management comes, you should always mention this case study. And I hope the person where you, where you have taken coaching or if you are studying on your own, you have read this doctrine of indoor management important uh, popular case uh, Turquoise rule. This is very very important case of Royal British Bank versus the Turquoise Turquoise rule. You should uh, remember this case study, Royal British Bank versus Turquoise, and you should mention. Then, uh, next, uh, coming to the next part of the answer, this is the what do we call um, the case study they have explained. You just have to write the conclusion. Bank can believe on uh, the undertaking given by the board and need not inquire further into it. So, the bank can claim the amount. That's all if you write, they will give you the box. Now, coming to the important things which should be there in your answer if they want to give you the marks. This thing, Doctrine of Indoor Management, dealing with the company is presumed to have read the rest of documents and they show that they are not inconsistent therewith and but they are not bound to do more. And they need not inquire into regularity, irregularity, irregularity of the pro internal proceedings as per required by the memorandum and articles. This thing should be there, regularity, need not inquire into regularity of the proceedings should be there. And they should have read the rest of the documents and the person dealing with the company are presumed to. 
So and one more the case study should be there. Royal British Bank vs. Turk Bank. And you just mentioned this conclusion. That's all. The answer is finished. How much is it? Four marks. Companies that don't nobody should skip the companies act. I'm telling you, even if you just brush up even the small uh, see just scan through the companies act at least don't skip the entire chapter. I'm telling you, it covers major things. What the students tend to do is if the chapter is big, they'll skip the chapter and they'll just do a remaining terms and they'll go they'll think that if we do the business correspondence and reporting part and some of two, three questions of law, we can just somehow manage it. But you can't. I'm telling you companies act is very important part, I'm telling you, because they can ask so many questions from companies act. And one more thing, people I don't understand why people are leaving partnership act. Partnership Act, see, in MTP, how many questions? Partnership, year one Partnership Act, year Partnership Act, year Partnership Act, two companies act. One question only, two companies act question, one Partnership Act. No, it's separate. But still, what I'm telling you is, they'll ask you so many questions from Partnership and Act and Companies Act only. They may not ask you the question from Contract and Act and Sale of Goods Act because the students, they know that they'll read only those acts and they'll come. So I won't get into the Gyan part of the uh, thing. I'll just tell you the what is there quickly now. Now coming to question number three. In question three, uh, what is the question? Question says that uh, can give or transfer the title to the goods which they in the themselves do not own. So this is the rule. We have to explain the rule and also state the cases in which the rule does not apply. As per the Sale of Goods Act. Now coming to the answer, I'll tell tell you one trick in the solution which you can write for all the points. But uh, yeah, now coming to the, the answer, exceptions to the rule of the none can give or transfer the goods which it does not itself own. So uh, in this, the cases where it does not apply, it does not apply is sale by mercantile agent, sale by one of the joint owners and uh, sale by person in possession of the goods under the voidable contract and sale by one who has already sold the goods but continues the possession thereof, sale by a buyer obtaining possession before the property in goods are vested in him and in case of sale by an unpaid seller. These points I'll explain it. And one more thing remember you can write any four points among this among the seven points you can write any four is enough don't write any extra point okay it's not needed just write four points crisp and keep it simple don't waste time anyways coming to this a sale by mercantile agent mercantile agent i hope you know an agent who in the customary course of business who is an agent general agent who can sell the agent who is the authority the owner is given the authority to sell the goods or to um, uh, sell the goods for purpose of uh, approval on the approval basis to consign the goods or to buy the goods or to raise the money uh, on security of the goods to raise the money and security of the goods to consign the goods either to sell the goods or for the purpose of the sale to buy the goods Okay, this is this. To consign the goods for purpose of sale, to buy the goods, raise the money, either to sell the goods. You need not write this uh, meaning of the customary, meaning of the mercantile agent. You need not write this. Mm, now, we have to write this. Sale by the mercantile agent. One point. Sale made by the mercantile agent. Sale made by the mercantile agent. Now, the goods or document, uh, which should give um, good title. Uh, which are those? Normally, the what is the mercantile agent? Same thing we have to write. The position of the goods or document with the consent of the owner, owner should give his permission uh, if he was in consent of the goods or document. If the sale was made by him with acting in the ordinary course of business as a mercantile agent, same thing, the meaning of mercantile agent only you have to write here. The position of the goods or documents consent owner you need. And if the sale is made by him when acting as the mm, in the ordinary course of business as a mercantile agent. And one more thing, this is the important point, which is common in all of them. If the buyer had acted in good faith and has had, had at the time of contract of sale no notice of the fact of the seller of that seller had no authority to sell. So in this, uh, if the buyer had acted in good faith and if the title of the uh, time of contract of sale, the notice of the fact that the seller had no authority, if the buyer had no, uh, he was not aware that the uh, seller was not, uh, he did not have the authority, did not take the owner's permission, but he acted in good faith. Okay, that is one point. Next, coming to sale by one of the joint owners. 
and one more thing you, for inside things which you are writing you can write it in your own sentence but the main point should be as given here sale by mercantile agent same thing you should write sale by mercantile agent sale by the one of the joint owners joint owners is not as the meaning says one of the joint owners there are several joint owners among them one person has the position of them and the permission by the others to sell the goods and if he transfer to another person who buys them from the joint owner in good faith and does not know that the at the time of the contract of sale that the no uh, seller had no authority to sell and uh, next coming to point number three sale by the person who is in position of the viable contract in case where the buyer who acquired the goods to a title to the goods sold to him by the seller who had obtained the position of the goods under the viable contract of the and whatever contract you have to mention which are viable which are viable the agreed party can uh, uh, demand damages uh, if it is a viable contract which are those the course and fraud misrepresentation and the influence in such the goods which you have received uh, from the fraud that you can sell it to a third party um, unless the contract had been not been rescinded until the time of sale. If it is rescinded by the time of sale, you cannot do. So you just have to the same position um, under whatever contract is. You can just tell that the buyer who has obtained the goods from a seller who has obtained the goods under fraud, coercion, or undue influence, uh, misrepresentation, but the um, contract uh, had not been rescinded until the time of the sale. Next, coming to next point, a sale by one who has already sold uh, the goods but continues in the position thereof. Where the person has sold the goods but the, he, he has sold the goods in contract but the position is still with him. In such a case, if the person has sold the goods but continues to be in his position in the documents of the title to them, he may sell them to a third party. So he may sell them to the third party. He may sell them to the you may sell them to a third party and if such a person obtains the delivery thereof without the notice of previous sale in good faith, then you would have the good title to them. Uh, the property is positive uh, from first buyer, the pledge or disposition of the title of the goods so will still be equally valid, same thing. So you just have to write here. Uh, I'll tell you what you should write in the answer. So I am just making you understand now. That is one point. Now coming to uh, fifth point. In this point, what they are saying is sale by a buyer obtaining the position before the property in the goods has vested in him. Here, see, here three parties are there. What is there is, see, the buyer with the consent of the seller obtains the position of the goods before the property in them has passed on to him. He may sell, pledge, or otherwise dispose of the goods to a third person. And if such a person obtains the delivery of the goods in good faith and without the notice of the lien or the right of the original seller, and in good faith, then uh, you would be good get the good title to them. So what they are saying is where a buyer no a buyer obtains the uh, consent of the seller. Uh, you obtain the consent of the seller and obtains the position of the goods before the property in them has passed on to him. Here a person a buyer is there. From the seller he obtains the consent before the property the goods no the seller himself has not obtained the goods but he he knows that he has the title to the goods. So the seller is giving the title to the buyer. The buyer using the title, no, he also has does not have the position to the goods before the goods has passed on to him. He may the seller, the the buyer with the title, he can sell or pledge or otherwise dispose of the goods to a third person. If such person obtains the delivery of the goods in good faith, then this will get a good title. You can write this in your own sentence. You just you don't have to complicate things. You can just write that there is a buyer is there with the consent of the seller. He obtains the position of the goods. Position of the goods means position of the title of the goods uh, before the goods has passed on to him. Before the goods are passed on to the buyer, he can sell, pledge, or otherwise dispose of the goods to a third person. If such person, the third person, if he obtains the goods in good, in good faith, in such a case, he will get a good title to them. It does not matter. Uh, whether without the notice of the lien or the right of the original settler, if he obtains the goods in good faith, uh, you will get a good title. This point is a little bit tricky. If you want, you can write, otherwise, you can just skip to the next point because um, if you can't remember the law sentence and the, uh, what is given there, okay, that's what I'm telling you. You can just remember main point, you can write this inside thing in your own sentence, but a little bit of just uh, say. You can't just change uh, everything. We have to write little bit of the words using the same things. Like if the person who is buyer is there, you know, he obtains the consent of the seller and you get the title to the goods and he can sell the title to the goods to third party or he can sell pledge or otherwise dispose of the goods to a third party. And third party obtains the goods in good faith. He, he, if he obtains it in good faith, he will get a good title. 
so understood so this point is a bit tricky you can just skip it if you want i've explained it uh, the most i can in this limited time so i can't explain it further if you want i can explain this point uh, after exams we can sit and discuss this point anyways coming to the next point sale by an unpaid seller this point was a contract which is easy to remember also unpaid seller where unpaid seller who has not yet received his payment so if he has the right of lien no he can uh, or the stoppage in the transit he can sell the goods and the buyer who obtains the goods can will have a good title that's it and next thing is uh in case of official receiver liquidator uh, if he sells the goods uh, then the time also purchaser will get a valid title in case of uh, purchase from the finder of the goods that time also will get a valid title if it is sale by pani under the default of the pawner then time also will get a valid uh, valid title to the goods these three points are very also very simple you can just remember the official receiver and the goods of from the finder of the goods then pani of uh, the pawner gets if he defaults then pani can sell the goods You can just write. Now coming to the points which you have to write and remember, and you have to write it. Then it should be in your answers. Just uh, you just mention the exceptions to the rule, uh, exceptions. Uh, then you just write sale by the mercantile agent one, and you just remember this mercantile agent. What does it say? Just same thing you write here. Okay, it's the same thing. It's not. There is no much difference. Then sale by one of the joint owners, and next thing is sale by a person in position of a void capital contract, and sale by official assignee partner, and that three points you have to remember. And next one more thing is in case sale was by one who has already obtained the goods, so who has already sold the goods, but continues to be in the position thereof. Mm. These points are easy, which you can remember, and paid seller. This point is also very easy. Only thing is remembering part is a very difficult one. That's why you can just uh, put this video on and you can see it twice so that you will remember stuff. Okay. Number two. In question number two, uh, there are three subdivisions are there. We'll go one by one fast. Okay. A coolie in uniform. Here what happens in uh, first sub question is there is a coolie who picks up the luggage of a person at the railway station without his consent, but the person allows him to do so. This is a case of implied contract. Question here is you have to tell the type of contract. And the question is for four marks. You have to check how many marks are there. Four marks, three points are there. One and a half, one and a half, one and a half. Okay. Now so here first one is implied contract. You have to explain what is implied contract. Then uh, implied contract uh, as the implied contract means uh, it comes into existence by implication. Implication is by law or by the action. Here it is by action, as per section nine. When an implied contract, when it lays down that in so far as such proposal or acceptance is made otherwise, the promise is said to be implied. Made otherwise than words. As I said, this is by action. We just have to write in this implied contract existence by implication, by action or by law implication. Section nine. How to say proposal or acceptance made otherwise than by words. Promise is said to be implied. Just to write that much is enough. Then obligation of the finder of the lost goods to return them to a true owner. In this case, it's a quasi contract. Quasi contract means here there is no acceptance offer is there. No, it's not there. The basics of the contract is not there. Basics of the agreement. So this is a quasi contract. So the law itself is uh, forming uh, is making the contract, binding the contract on the people here. So, what is the answer? Quasi contract we have to write. The obligation of the finder of goods return the goods to the owner. It cannot be said to arise out of the contract, even in the remote sense. There is neither offer or acceptance or consent, so it is said to be quasi contract. If we write that is that much, that is okay. That is enough. If you want, you can explain what is quasi contract in one or two lines. You can just say quasi contract is not an actual contract. Uh, it is created by law under certain circumstances. It enforces legal rights when there is no real real contract exists. This is enough. You can just say uh, there is no intention of the party either party to make a contract, but law imposes the contract upon the parties. If you just write even this much, it's enough. 
I just write it's a quasi contract and quasi contract mm, is not an actual contract it is based upon by the law created by law in certain circumstances and there is no real contract at this there is no intention of any of the either of party to make the contract but law imposes a contract upon them enforces the legal rights that's enough okay that's enough next coming to question number part 3 part 3 here what is there in this case what happens is a contract uh, this is similar to the RTP question this is similar to RTP question go and see my RTP discussion video you will come to know the similar type of question is there here what happens is there is a, a who contacts B for its supply of the uh, 10 tons of sugar but what happens is the fire is caught in factory and everything was destroyed so it becomes a void contract void contract means is not enforceable in law that much you have to write that's what they have mentioned it is a void contract and it is ceased to be enforceable by law mm, becomes void cannot be enforced by a court of law that's what it's. now what does it say to form a valid contract consideration must be adequate for three marks they have asked you just have to write and i'll mark here only i'll tell you for first of all there is no requirement for uh, adequate consideration or inadequate consideration if consideration is there it's enough for a contract okay that much you should know then here what they have given is the law provides the contract should be supported by consideration as long as consideration is there the court is not concerned with adequacy it should be of some value and one important part in this answer is consideration must however be something to which the law attaches value though it need not be equivalent in value to the promise made what does it mean it means that suppose if i am selling a watch to you uh, which costs around 50000 for 10000 so it does not mean that the contract is invalid the contract is valid here just because the uh, watch of 50,000 and selling it to you for 10,000 does not make the contract invalid. However, we should check whether the promise is the promise which uh, the amount which which I am selling you know, whether it was promise or consent of the promiser was given freely that there is no coercion, misrepresentation, or undue influence is not there of you on me whether I am selling it out of force, pressure no that we have to check that's what they have, tell, they have told here and one more important thing is the adequacy of the consideration is of the parties to consider at the time of making the agreement and not for the court when it's supposed to be enforced i will mark the point which you should write in your answer right we'll see the answer now section 25 of the indian contract act which says that an agreement to which the consent of the promiser is freely given is not void merely because the consideration is inadequate but the inadequacy of the consideration must be taken into account by the court to determine whether the consent of the promiser was given freely that's what, what i said that whether the consent of me is taken by you um, while giving the 50,000 watch for 10,000 there is no undue pressure or influence by you on me that's what we should check that's what the court will check now coming to the answer the answer which you should write the, uh, for three marks now this much is enough if you write I'll mark the things way what you should write we should write is the law provides the contract should be supported by um, consideration one thing and if adequacy does not matter it should be of some value and something to which the law should attach the value it is not equivalent in value to the promise made and then this part is there no this part you need not write but if you can if you remember it you can write this is important but still as per section 25 an agreement to which the consent of the promiser is freely given is not merely not void merely because the consideration is adequate but the inadequacy of the consideration is should be taken into account by the court in determining the question whether the consent of the promiser was freely given if you read it two three times you will be able to remember it just see it once before you go to the exam okay next coming to question number uh, sub question number three of the part in question two this is based on llp and this is very very important guys okay this is very very important this can come in your exam and since llp act is amended since there is amendment in the llp act i hope you guys have checked out the rtp amendment llp amendment act just given which has been given in rtp which is very important from your exam point of view it can come for five marks just like this the same question can come small limited liability partnership what is LL, small llp as per the, as per the llp act 2008 as per the llp amendment act 2021 this is llp amendment act 2021 what is small LLP? 
small LLP means there the, I have explained it properly in my video of the LLP Amendment Act which I have discussed in the RTP. Two videos are there, you should, both the videos are very important and important points are marked there. Anyways, in this question there was small LLP. Small LLP as per the Limited Liability Partnership Act 2008 as per the Amendment Act 2021. The contribution is up to the contribution is there no, should not exceed 25 lakhs and of such a year amount which can be extended which can be increased to 5 crores which can 25 5 you should remember 25 5 one thing you should remember is 25 5 then and this is and is there don't forget okay this is and and means you should always remember plus plus means both should be there both the limit should be there for it to become the small LLP. If it satisfies only one limit, does not. If it does not satisfy this, then it is not a small LLP. It should satisfy both the limits. Okay, that's that's what and means. Okay, plus. I hope you understood the concepts. I'm discussing a little bit deeper here now. Anyways, the uh, the contribution of which contribution is 25 lakhs and 5 lakhs. 25 5. We remember like this. 25. 25 and 5 okay it can be increased to 5 contribution and the turnover as per the statement of solvency and the accounts is 40 lakhs and 50 lakhs 40 50 you can remember like this 40 lakhs which can be extended to 50 crores which can be extended to 50 crores which can be extended to 50 crores does not exceed 40 lakh rupees are uh, not exceeding 50 crores this fifth this 5 and 50 no this the government has not it made it it has not yet set the limit what this sentence means the some people don't explain the sentences some teachers i'm explaining you this properly understand it now okay the contribution of which does not exceed 25 lakh or such higher amount not exceeding 5 crore rupees as newly described which means that currently the government has set as limit as 25 lakhs for small llp contribution but it can be extended to 5 crores if the government intends Okay, like that, the turnover is also like that, which meets such other requirements and requirement fulfills such terms and conditions as may be prescribed. That's what small LLP means. Next question, question number three, sub question one. Here, in what happens is Mr. A is there, he transfers his share in the partnership firm to Mr. B. Uh, we have to tell whether Mr. B is not, is not entitled to few rights and privileges as Mr. A is entitled, therefore. What are these points that which we have to tell for four marks? which Mr. B is not entitled during continuance of the partnership. You can tell mm, these points, no, like he is, Mr. B is entitled for the share of the profit in the partnership firm as agreed by the partners, but he is not entitled to check the books, accounts, he is not entitled to interfere with the business of the partnership firm. Okay, that's what they have given. You have, the answer I will show you, number 29 of the Partnership Act 1932. I transfer by the partner of his interest in the firm either absolute or by mortgage or by creation of charge uh, such interest uh, does not entitle the transferee during the continuance of the firm to interfere in the conduct of the business or to require the accounts or to inspect the books of firm okay and but he is entitled to receive only the share of profits of the transferring partner and he shall accept the account of profits agreed by the partners and he cannot challenge the partner who has been uh, who, to whom the person has transferred his share, his interest. That person has to accept the profit and he cannot challenge the accounts. He is bound to accept the profits as agreed by the partners. He cannot challenge that uh, why you are giving me only this much profits. He can't challenge them, challenge the partners, uh, partners' accounts. He cannot challenge the partnership firm accounts as to the profit. Okay. He is only entitled to receive the share of profits which the transferring partner is giving. Okay. The same thing which he here, no, the same thing which is here, the same thing is given here. Uh, same thing, you have to just correlate the provision with the answer, with the question. What they are given not to interfere with the conduct of business, to require the accounts, to inspect the books of the firm. Just write this much, okay. What you should write is, I'll mark C. You just have to write a section 29 if you remember and a transfer by the partner of his interest either absolute or by mortgage by creation of the charge uh, during the continuance of the firm no, and he cannot interfere in the conduct of the business to require the accounts to inspect the books of firm this is the provision and he shall accept the profit uh, accept the account of the profits agreed by the partners 
this much you, 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 if you write that's enough is only in regulatory pressure of profits just correlate this provision and correlate this provision with the solution with the question okay when you can what you cannot do mr b is not entitled to enter future under to the business to require the accounts to inspect the books of firm he is bound to accept the profits conclusion you can just write he is bound to accept the profits as agreed by the partners and he cannot challenge the accounts bound to accept the profits uh, as agreed by the partners he cannot challenge the books of the accounts of the firm okay that is one question number 3 answer now coming to question number 3 part 1 is over part 2 this is very very important don't forget to read before your exams okay next is coming to what is particular partnership act uh, particular partnership as per partnership act this is also important question but it's very simple particular partnership it is formed for a particular adventure or for a, um, when like particular project once the project advance is over the partnership for a firm will disgate it all that's all that's, that's what particular partnership is you can just write Uh, if you write only that much, uh, they might not give you marks. So uh, we have to write what is given here. A partnership may be organized for the prosecution of a single adventure as well as the, for the conduct of a continuous business. A person will enter into partnership with another person, in particular for a particular adventure undertaking. The partnership is called particular adventure. Is called partner particular partnership. I'm watching from South India. uh this is for you guys especially because you don't understand hindi you know that's why i'm doing this videos for you guys i hope this is helpful for you and uh, please comment down below and let me know your suggestions your opinions if i need to change my teaching style or what i should more i should teach this anything else okay so uh, in this question particular partnership you understood no you just have to write it is formed for a particular adventure undertaking and that is called particular partnership and uh, once that uh, single adventure undertaking is over the partnership will get dissolved in completion after the adventure undertaking that's what same thing we have mentioned now coming to question number 3 part 3 this one is very very important this question is very very important this question is very very important i am marking this one as well please study this question before exams it can come directly in your exams i am telling you again and again this question is very very important it's on sale of goods act it's about the damages i explain the question what uh, what that having is there is a person called seema seema she was running a boutique in new delhi she wants to deliver some clothes to her friend who was putting up an exhibition in mumbai okay then seema delivered the same machine and the cloth to a railway company to be delivered at the where the exhibition is to be held but what happened is uh, seema she expected an exceptional profit from the sale that they made at the exhibition but she did not inform the um, uh, on railway authorities that um, there is a time by which they should deliver the goods uh, to her friend kiran because the exhibition uh, see exhibition is happening in a particular date they have to deliver it before that date if the date is over and they should be delivered late then uh, she will be in losses now that's what is happened here she did not inform the railway authorities that should be delivered on time so they delivered delivered it bit later so the goods were delivered at the place after the conclusion of the exhibition after the exhibition is over the goods were delivered at the place so on account of such breach of the contract by the railway authorities can seem a recover the loss that's the question do you understand the question i'll explain the question once again there is a person called seema she is she has a boutique in new delhi her friend kiran who is in mumbai she is putting up an exhibition for that she needs uh, clothes and uh, sewing machine which seema is sending she um, delivered it to railway company to send it to give it to the, her friend in kiran there okay to deliver it but what happened is she did not inform seema did not inform the railway authorities about the exhibition date so they delivered the cloth and the sewing machine later so now and seema expected a huge amount of exceptional profit from the sales in the made in the exhibition now she suffered loss now because the exhibition is over after the conclusion of the exhibition they delivered it so now can seema recover the loss of the profits and the important part of the question is this is one is exceptional profit she is expecting and but the very important part in this question is this one that act is not brought to the notice of the railway authorities this fact is not brought to the notice of the railway authorities she did not tell the railway authorities that the exhibition is happening in this date you have to deliver it by this date okay i'm spending a little bit more time in this i'll divide the mtp into two parts okay part 1 and part 2 anyways now coming to the solution this is based on the damages question on damage okay 
Now 73 to 75, it is based on section 73 to 75. 75 of the Indian Contract Act. Damage means any sum of money. Now what is damage? Damage is the compensation which we claim, which is sum of money for the loss which the, we have suffered. For that we claim compensation from the other party. So same thing only they tell. Damage means the sum of money claimed or awarded as compensation for loss or injury. Okay, this much you have to write in your uh, exam solution first. Then next we have to tell about general damages and special damages because here special damages is occurred but you will not get the special damage compensation why that is the question okay it is based on first we shall will tell what is general damages general damages is whenever a party commits a breach the aggrieved party will claim the compensation for the loss they have suffered party has committed the breach and they will claim the uh, compensation that is the general damages it is like which arise naturally in the usual course of the things from the breach which, uh, from the breach itself from the breach itself which occurs uh, in the usual course of things this is based on hadley versus baxendale next therefore when the breach is committed by the party the defendant shall be liable for all losses that are actually arise in the course of the business so the defendant shall be li held liable for the the defendant shall be held liable for the damages in the natural course of the business he will be held liable for all the losses which has occurred in the natural course of the business that is general damages such damages are called ordinary damages or general damages. Special damages are what course of business no, naturally arise in the course of business. Special means special, unusual. They arise in the unusual circumstances affecting the aggrieved party. The damages are recoverable only when the special circumstances were brought to the knowledge of the defendant. This is the important part in the answer which the evaluator will be expecting in your paper if this question comes we have to write this special damages arise in unusual circumstances affecting the aggrieved party such damages are recoverable only when the special uh, circumstance is brought to the knowledge of the defendant it is only brought to the knowledge of the defendant then uh, then only you will get the special damages otherwise you won't get when it is brought to a notice of the uh, party Special circumstances were brought to knowledge of the defendant. Now, coming back, if the special notice is given, then the aggrieved party can claim the ordinary. If special notice is not given, then the only ordinary damage still can claim. That is the answer. Now, this is the they have given in the instant case, they have given along with the conclusion. They have uh, correlated the provision. The goods were delivered after the conclusion and she can recover only the losses in the ordinary course of the business. Special damages are allowed only when special circumstances are made aware. Here the special circumstances are not made aware. She did not tell that by this date you have to deliver the uh, goods to her friend, to a railway authority. She did not give the notice. So they delivered it a bit later after the exhibition was over. So now she survived the losses. It is special circumstance. She should have told that by, please deliver it by this time. She did not tell. So, since the notice about special circumstances was given to railway authorities, since no notice about special circumstances was not given, no notice is given, so she could not recover the loss of profit. She could only recover the ordinary damages she can recover, but not the special damages. That much you have to write. And this conclusion part is very, very important. Read it twice, read it thrice if you want, but it sh these points which are marked, no, it should be there in your answer if the evaluator should give you marks. Otherwise, you won't get marks and telling you again and again and this case law the case law is not necessary you need not write this case law it's fine just write the points which i have told about the first you should just write what is what is damage mean damage means and next explain general damage and write what is special damage uh, that it should be special damage can be recovered only when it is brought to knowledge of the dependent if no special notice is given then she can claim only ordinary damage and correlate with the case studies and write the answer that's all finished uh, please subscribe and like my videos because i am not telling this until now uh, but it motivates me to do more videos for you guys please comment subscribe and like it gives me motivation i'll put more and more videos for you guys thank you good luck